And now, a session brought to you by our underwriter. Please welcome Sarab Saha, Senior Vice President and Global Head of Translational Medicine at Bristol Myers Squibb, and John Saltzman, a reporter at the Boston Globe. Uh, my name is Jonathan Saltzman. I cover biotech for the Boston Globe, and um, I interviewed uh, Sharab uh, last year uh, for a story about doctors who go into the drug industry. Um, Sharab, is R&D productivity in the drug industry a growing concern, and if so, why? So John, thanks for uh, being here, and thanks to The Atlantic for speaking on such an important topic. Uh, R&D productivity efficiency is top of mind to senior leaders of pharmaceutical companies, and most importantly, to our stakeholders, our patients and providers. We all want to see increased productivity. We want to set a higher bar for transformational uh, new medicines. We have a lot to celebrate. Over the last few years, we've had approvals in gene therapies, cellular immunotherapies, and we've seen an accelerated pace of treatments for rare diseases, unlike what we've ever seen before. Now, the FDA last year in 2018 had a record 59 approvals, and that's fantastic, but we can do better. We can do more. Investment in R&D has been significant in both biotech and pharma. In 2018, the venture community invested over $20 billion in biotech, twice as much than five years ago. At the same time, in pharma, we've seen the $100 billion investment mark being crossed for the first time in 2018 by the top 15 pharmaceutical companies. So given those statistics, you'd think, well, there should be an incredibly positive trend line for R&D productivity. But the sobering fact is, is that from the time a patent is filed to an approval, the time it takes for that drug to get approved is still about 13 years. We haven't seen much of a chain, change over the last 15 or last 10 years or so. So that begs the question that all of us in the room have to ask is, why is that the case? Are we not understanding disease biology well enough? Are we not understanding the mechanism of action of our drugs? Do we not have the right operating model for R&D organizations? Or are we not deploying the technology in a way that is useful for increasing productivity? And we see this in the two biggest therapeutic areas, autoimmune disease and cancer. In autoimmune disease, we still treat patients with steroids for the large part. In cancer, we've had incredible success in the first half of this decade delivering checkpoint therapies and CAR-T therapies, cellular immunotherapies, with incredible success. But in the latter half of this decade, we're still searching for that next wave of immunotherapy breakthroughs uh, to come to patients. And this is in large part due to the fact that we operate in very crowded therapeutic areas. We have assets and programs with high correlated risk. And we have an investment community that largely invests with a herd mentality in, in the similar type of modalities uh, and medicines. So we have to do a lot better. And uh, I'm very optimistic, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about that. Do some companies cleave to uh, uh, certain drug development approaches for too long uh, without bearing fruit? The short answer to that is yes. And it's largely cultural. Uh, what we have to do better is change our mindset and how we prioritize programs uh, in the industry. Uh, we tend to uh, develop small molecules or biologics or other modalities and when we do that, the train's kind of left the station, and we see a glide path to the clinic, and we just keep going. The incentive to actually stop a program, which could be just as important as accelerating important programs, is not there. So we need to be able to ask the question three, four years into a program, is this drug or is this target as relevant or validated today as it was when we started that program five years ago? We have to constantly be validating a target. At the same time, we have to ask ourselves a question, what, are the, what is the bar that we need to hit when a drug goes into patients? Does it hit its target? Does it modulate the pathway? Does it affect disease biology in a way that is going to be meaningfully important for a patient? If we set the bar and not change that bar when we're into the clinic, uh, then I think we'll see productivity. And if the bar is not met, we stop a program. If it's met, we put more resources on it. How does the size of a drug company and its portfolio affect uh, the productivity of its R&D program? 
Yeah, so traditionally there's a notion that smaller companies uh, have increased productivity because of the innovation per dollar spent ratio is much higher. Uh, and that is partly true. If you look at the last 59 approvals, as I mentioned by the FDA last year, more than half of those came from emerging uh, biopharma companies. Those companies that spend less than $200 million a year in R&D and have less than $500 million in top line revenue. Um, those companies have less organizational strictures uh, compared to bigger pharma companies, for example. But that being said, the bigger pharma companies have a scale and resources that other smaller companies don't have, and we can generate patents and programs and assets, cre creating a diverse portfolio uh, that is often very useful uh, to us. At Bristol Myers Squibb, we feel we've achieved the sweet spot between having the uh, organization scale and resources of a large pharma company, but also the progressive spirit and nimbleness of a biotech company. And I think nowhere is that more relevant today than our new opening of the Cambridge R&D facility uh, here, where we have essentially created a biotech-like structure and operating model within a larger pharmaceutical company where we have a few hundred FTEs, people who work on uh, cancer, and they have a single-minded focus toward tackling one question, which is how do we overcome cancer immunotherapy resistance? So that's, I think, a good example of having the best of both worlds. How does the uh, very fast pace of evolving technology affect R&D? Does it make it more productive or does it make it less productive? So I, I think both, and we have to be realistic. Science, um, major leaps in science occur when you have a technology that allows you to measure things better. And we've seen this, I think, most importantly in cancer recently. So by measuring the antigenicity of a tumor in a patient, by counting the number of mutations that patient has, and assessing its inflammation status, by looking at markers such as PDL1 or its inflammation status by gene expression signatures, those are ways in which we can profile the disease and be able to tell a patient you should get drug X or a combination of drugs. So that's productivity coming from uh, newer technologies. But that being said, there, we shouldn't be following technology for the sake of following technology, just because it's cool. There isn't a single week that goes by where there's a publication that all of us get excited about, uh, and we have technology ADD of sorts. Uh, and we start validating that technology without really thinking about where is this going to be applicable to patients? How is this going to take a drug forward in clinical trials and ultimately to market? Um, and that's where we have to do better, is ask ourselves a question, does this technology matter for patients? How does a company's culture affect innovation? So that's a great question, and one we take very seriously uh, at Bristol-Myers Squibb, and I can speak for our company. Uh, it takes a lot of heart to pursue a medicine. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of perseverance. And oftentimes coming at personal sacrifice, to many individuals who want to see that drug cross that finish line and ultimately get approved. And I think there's a great story that exemplifies this by Matt Herper at, at STAT yesterday uh, on a world famous uh, researcher, Nils Lonberg, who is at Bristol Myers Squibb and is actually retiring today. Uh, a fantastic uh, story about how his tenacity and perseverance allowed him to help discover uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, the drugs anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, which have made such a difference in changing, frankly, changing the course of cancer history. And that was uh, rewarded, that science was rewarded with a Nobel Prize uh, last year. Uh, so Nils is just an ex exemplification of that type of culture that I think we have as a company uh, and that we need to have more of. How do you see R&D changing over the next five to 10 years? What do you see as being the biggest challenges? So I think culture is probably the biggest, um, biggest challenge that we have to overcome is our mindset on how we view programs, how we move programs forward. One of the things that we uh, have uh, given a lot of thought to is uh, having rigorous debate. Oftentimes when you get into a room and you're making decisions, uh, there's an echo chamber. People are nodding, everyone's nodding and saying yes, 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 because the other folks are nodding. But we want to get people to say, you know what, I don't think that's a good idea, or I really think that's a good idea. So we have rigorous debate amongst the people who are making incredibly important decisions of which drugs to take into patients. So I think that's one, is changing the culture, the mindset where this not invented here mentality has to, has to take effect, that we take data from 
inside and outside, and make rigorous decisions. Second is translational research is gonna be incredibly important in our pursuit of medicines. We're seeing more and more of these new emerging technologies being deployed in the clinical setting and getting real-time data and feeding that back into our discovery organization in what we call reverse translation and then feeding that data and new hypotheses back into the clinic into patients in what's called forward translation. So I think the future of R&D is incredibly bright uh, and uh, we have a lot of work to do, but we're cognizant that we have to overcome some of these challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you.